It's Miss Fatima Ali Mohammed. Hey, good afternoon, Rashad. Thank good you for having me here. Oh, of course, Fatima. Of course, Fatima. So please introduce yourself to to the people, to the audience. Let them know who you are. You can do it much better than me. Uh, first and foremost, one, I mean, I'll put two fun facts that uh, to yeah. your list before I introduce myself is <laughs> we're the exporters of the best um, people in the world as leadership. So Barack Obama, yeah. Kenyan, <laughs> and obviously the prime minister in the UK right now, um, you know, Rishi Sunak. Kenyan as well, I mean, Karen, Kenyan heritage. Right. So we're saying anyone who wants to become anything, you know, in the world, make sure you sort of come back to Kenya or, you know, take a Kenyan citizenship for us to send you to the rest of the world. So those are two fun facts um, out of out of Kenya as well. Okay. You said take on Kenyan citizenship. Is that something that... Um, sure. You can. Naturalization is one part and obviously people can apply for the others. If you, you pledge your loyalty to a nation... Um, you know why not? But it's it's just a teaser to tell people, hey, we we bring the best um, out. You know, from athletes to now people who run countries as well. Oh wow, that, that that's wonderful. That's amazing. So great. Uh, my name is Fatima Ali Mohammed, yeah. like you've said. Um, been in Ghana for 13 years. I don't call. I mean, I'm Kenyan, and that's what I'll always be known for. But yeah. I call myself an African who happens to be living in Ghana. Okay. Because because we've got to change this whole perception of defining ourselves as countries. Otherwise, we become like what some leaders from certain countries have referred to Africa as a country. Yeah. Right? That whole confusion. <laughs> so you know where I'm, where yeah. I'm coming from. Africa is a, yeah. is, is a continent, it's a continent. Not a country. Um, so I've been here for, it's going to be 13 years in the next um, five months. And um, I see myself being here longer, unless there's any other reason um, to leave. But more than that, um, I wear different hats, like you've rightly said. Mm -hmm. um, I w I'm with AGI um, as the former chair of the agribusiness sector, still very in tune in that in terms of trying to um, take people out of poverty. And the only way we can do that is create sustainability for food because that's the one thing that will keep us going for generations to come. But what I do most importantly is um, I run a consultancy. I came to Ghana to set up, I'm sure, a brand everybody knows in Ghana called Frytol, the mm. cooking oil. That was yeah. my baby. I set that up. I set up wow. that factory, um, set up the branding for it, and made it the number one brand in, in, in Ghana today. Wow. So I take, I, I take um, full accolades for that, and obviously yeah. with the team that, that worked with it. Um, after that, I branched out into consultancy because I just felt there is so much for us as Africans that we're really not tapping on. And it's sad that when it comes to selling to our own people, we sell them stuff that really is not worthy of themselves. Mm -hmm. But when we're exporting to the first world, the supposed first world, we make sure the packaging's right. We make sure the brand's right. You know, everything else is right. So my role was why, to why, come in. Excuse me. Why do you think that? Um, because we we don't, I think we as, as Africans don't value ourselves um, good enough. We don't think we're worthy of having the best. And that's the reason you find a lot of goods coming from the outside being dumped to us, you know, from Asia and wherever <clears throat> else. Um, I know I was, I, somebody put up something. We In Ghana, we have, just like other countries, you have the international expatriate groups. Yeah. And, and uh, one of these um, foreign ladies, ladies came on and asked, um, she was asking a question about where they could buy secondhand clothes. And in Ghana, it's known as um, Obruni Wawu. Mm -hmm. And Obruni Wawu actually means clothes of the dead. And um, basically, secondhand clothes, like when they used to come in from the UK and stuff like that, it was stuff that was being given to Oxfam or to wherever else. So it was stuff that was being get, gotten rid of, like, you know, in the US and in, in, in the UK, you just leave stuff outside your house and people just come and pick it. If somebody wants a sweater, a jumper, if they find something in the dustbin, they're going to take it. But that was all being shipped to Africa. Mm. Now, we, in the process, realize we're losing our respect and dignity because we can't be people that have to wear secondhand clothes of the dead. And that's where the conversation has to come in. And that's why I've come into play to try and say, how can we restore our dignity as Africans? Self-image. Yes. Not only image, it's self-appreciation mm. and understanding that we feed the world. Everything. I mean, today we talk about, you know, we were discussing the other day about Black Lives Matter and stuff like that. At the end of the day, the first world has been built on the backs of Africans, right? Yes. Whether it's you want to talk about the White House or you want to talk about the um, the, the monarchy 
key in the UK, it was built on the backs of Africans. Everything that was taken away from here, and we continue to perennially do that. So when we talk about colonization, colonization continues even to date. The difference is that we're not being ruled, you know, physically, but we're being ruled by the mind. So the role that I come in with is to say we're worthy and we're capable of doing what we want to do for ourselves, for our own. So that's why African Brand Warrior came to being. And it does a lot of things in terms of advocacy, in terms of brand strategy, in terms of marketing, but building it from the perspective, it's for Africans by Africans. If for African Brand Warrior, if you could summarize the, the mission or the goal in, in, in one simplified sentence, it's to lift the people of Africa to where they belong. To where they belong. And obviously that, that should be the, the where, leaders of the, of the world. Yeah, we're the cradle of mankind. Everything started from here. So we can't be second-guessing ourselves. And I know that people have an issue when we, we say that we're the dark continent. I love being called the dark continent because for us to even be sitting in this room for there to be light, it's because darkness exists. Light does not exist in the absence of darkness. So we are what we are. We just have to be able to take charge of it and run with it. Yeah, and for you, what, what, what inspired you? Because we, we, we talked about your accolades and we talked about your, you know, some, some of the long list of, 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 of accomplishments and leadership that you have done. What, what was your original inspiration to really want to be one of the individuals at the forefront to um, increasing brand quality in Africa, um, increasing, I like the word um, self-image, because I believe that when you, we have visions we're able to really reach our true potential. And as we, you know, move forward on Beach Africa, 3FM 92.7, I want the listeners to leave this conversation understanding that their brand, whether it's tourism, whether it's entertainment, that their brand represents themselves. And how are we going to move forward as a people to our rightful place in the world? So what initially got, gave you that inspiration? So one of the things is that um, with the companies that I've worked for, I've worked for great companies, Bitco, Wilma, um, who do, you know, African brands, they're just as good as multinationals. Um, and having worked with them and having, I've literally been to quite a few countries on this continent. Mm -hmm. um, and it's amazing to see the similarities that we have. While we're similar, the person in West Africa is so different from the person in South Africa. The person in North Africa is so different from the person in East Africa. So as much as we want to see ourselves as one continent, we're so different. But our values are the same. You know, if you look at a child running on the street, smiling, regardless of being hungry, not having had three meals a day, there's certain things that we have that brings us together. So it reached a point where it came in first, obviously, because of being a woman, being in a male-dominated field secondly it just came a second nature i'm a fighter and hence the reason also the name warrior because mm -hmm. war is about going into a battlefield right the difference here the battlefield is not about blood it's about brands and fighting for what our people need to deserve and to get better so the inspiration came from why should our people have to settle for less when it comes to buying products that their children are going to consume in their homes so let me ask you, African Brand Warrior, define brand, because there may be people who, who, who still don't understand. Understand what a brand is. Yeah. Okay. So first and foremost, the origin of branding came in from the time of history, the African history, when, and also the Americans used to do that, when you had a lot of cattle and sheep and goats and you were um, a, a person who was herding. So it, it even started with slave trade. So if you recall or remember anything to do with history, sadly, that's where branding started from, where the British, the Portuguese, you know, all came down. And when they were taking slaves, they had to put a marking on them. And they used to take this iron rod, putting, put it in fire and mark it on our people's skin to say, this is my person, they belong to me. So when you saw that marking, you took it. So creating an icon 
on the person started as branding then the next thing it moved was to animals you know people would go and say okay this is the symbol of my cattle so you know it so branding is basically creating an identity an image a logo mm. where then it does doesn't just become static and it's not a visual it's putting life to it where you put a brand voice brand tonality brand image brand feel so if for example I, I i know obviously we're in media we're not supposed to take any brands but normally what we do as brand people we give you a brand name and we tell you you know visualize what do you see so if let's say it was a soft drink or it was an alcohol beer or it was a um, 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 a soap would tell you to visualize and tell us what do you think of it if it was a person so a brand is a living thing um, mm. and it's what you do I mean 36 you know 3 FM 92.7 is a brand in itself you yourself are as a uh, you know a brand and so is Fatima great job great job um, for those out there your brand represents you why do people want to travel with you since we're on the travel show why do people want to buy from you? Why do you buy a certain brand in the store? We can't really name too many brands, but why do you choose this soft drink over another? Why do you choose those biscuits over another? Why do you go to that restaurant? Because you trust their brand. Fatima, if you had to give um, three pieces of advice for anyone who wants to start a brand the first piece of advice i want you to give them is why is having a brand important so i'd split it i, I think that question has many answers to it because mm -hmm. in branding we have individual brands as you and i as people then we have them in the service industry then and we have them in the hospital. I mean, hospitality falls under service as well. Then you have them under consumables. So it totally depends on which one. The first advice that I want to give people is I've seen there's a huge disconnect when people go on social media as themselves and then want to be taken seriously when they go into a boardroom. Mm -hmm. When you are going out on social media, clubbing, parting, not that there's anything wrong with it. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to carry yourself with a certain demeanor, with a certain integrity, with a certain authenticity, mm -hmm. so that when you go into a boardroom tomorrow, whether you're the CEO or the employee, there has to be a, a, a connection between the two. You don't want to be seen as a party animal as one in the other, and then you're expecting to go and discuss equity and shares in the other, because mm -hmm. you're not going to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. Then you have also when you know you preach water to one and you go and preach wine to the other there has mm -hmm. to be a consistency in that so it's very important for people to understand that whatever you do online and offline must match when it comes to brands that are consumed it's very important to first start with integrity and mm -hmm. also understand what solution is the product that you're bringing coming to provide mm -hmm. right so if you thought about something for example as simple as a cup who thought about creating this deep hollow vessel and then put in a handle which can be used by a left-handed person and a right-handed person right mm -hmm. so when creating a brand first understand the, the the first answer you must have is what solution is it coming to provide there has to be a problem for you to come and create something because your creation is coming to solve a problem so i guess it goes back to the drawing board understanding who are you doing it for who's your target audience you know, what is the problem that they're facing and what is it that you're coming to address? And then it comes to country branding. So, for example, I played a role in Brand Kenya. And um, if you know also much about South Africa, South Africa had um, at one point been seen only as a nation of apartheid. And it was not to be seen as a place that was doing anything great. It was all about oppression and, you know, hate and racism. Today, you look at South Africa. South Africa has branded itself as the businessmen's play field. So you can go there for business. You can go there for pleasure. A lot of people don't remember anything about apartheid today because South Africa went and did an amazing branding for themselves. If you talk about Kenya, we worked on what is called Magical Kenya. If you go in, you type on Google, look for Brand Kenya. And Brand Kenya, that's the reason today Kenya promotes itself on athletes, on tourism, on food, on aviation. It's been able to create a strategy for itself. So every Every country also has its own branding that gets to be done. So it's it's a very, like I said, it's a very, very uh, wide question um, to answer. Kenya, what is Kenya branded for? When, when most people think of Kenya, we, we think of safaris. We think yeah. of, you know, national parks. Does, does Kenya have a, a branding 
problem. Somebody, a Kenyan friend of mine um, called me this week and they asked me to give them advice on how to help Kenya become a tourist attraction for other members of the diaspora, similar to the great job that Ghana is doing. And to stick with brand, my advice to him was, look at what Ghana has done in terms of the, the government being on board, the president being on board, the people being on board. That's all branding. Ghana is being branded as the go-to destination for Africa, um, especially during the holiday season. Before, before we move forward, we're gonna take a break. We have many more things that we want to discuss. Last week on social media, we had people interacting with us on Facebook. We asked the general public to identify a monument in Africa. The answer was Ghana. It was the um, Kwame Nkrumah Museum. So if anybody in Ghana got that wrong, shame on you. <laughs> now, there's a new question on the Facebook page. And the answer was tough. But then it was a, 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 oh, duh, I get it. So go to our Facebook handle now, 3FM 92.7. Go answer that question. And if you do not know the answer, just think really hard. And then when we come back, maybe we'll give you the answer. Maybe we won't. But we'll be back because we want to talk about trade, business opportunities, and so much more that we're going to talk about. Yeah. See you soon. We're heading towards our... East African correspondent, Bonnie Face. Bonnie Face, are you are you here? Hello, you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. I can hear you now. I heard you in my ear, but now I hear you clearly. Bonnie Face, how are you? <laughs> I'm very fine. Great to speak to you again. Great to speak to you again. Same um here. yeah. Same Thank you so much. Bonnie Face um, called me during the week and he and he interviewed me on um, East Africa's Kenya, um, biggest, biggest, biggest newspaper. And um, it was an honor to, to wake up this morning to to know that um, to, to, to get so many Kenyan followers knowing that we were doing the show in Kenya today. So I want to thank you um, for that live on air. And I'm glad that our East African correspondent um, is here with us to share us some news coming from Kenya. Awesome. Pleasure was all mine, Rashad. Oh, blessings, blessings, blessings. Please, um, our guest, Fatima Ali Mohammed, African brand mm -hmm. warriors here. So I'm giving her permission to kind of chime in here and there when she hears some of the news that's coming out of East Africa, Kenya. Awesome. Hi, Fatima. Hi, Fatima. Hi, Sawa means okay. That means stop it, stop it, stop it. It means okay, okay, but it's like, all right, all right, all right, all right. Sawa, sawa, sawa. Yeah, that's one thing about Kenyans. Once we get together, we just we just roll in the mother tongue. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. And and I can attest for that. I spent some time in um, Kenya, Lake Nabasha, Nairobi. Kenyans will just start speaking Swahili right in front of you, whether you speak English or or, or not. So you know, this is what we learn on Beats Africa: just different cultures and traditions. And we'll definitely get more into that in a few minutes. Bonnie Face, please give us the gossip, give us the juice, give us the news. <laughs> So I'll start right off where you were talking about um, the article that we did about Ghana out hosting Kenya when it comes to big, big events. I mean, you guys have had Afro Nation, you've had Afrochella, and all these big, 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 big um, concerts. Afro Future now. To, yeah, they're yeah, going to change the name Afro Afrochella to Afro Future. Congratulations yeah, to them. Move it to, exactly, exactly. You know? And one of the things that, and it's actually going to have a lot of reaction locally here, a lot of guys are like, what do you mean? I was being crucified for, 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 for praising Ghana, but it's fun, it's fun, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, one of the things that is coming out is, of course, security, government support. Um, compared to Kenya, obviously, the Ghanaian um, entertainment industry, I think, received a lot of government support and deliberate marketing. But 
And addition to that, I mean, we with the new government that has just come in, they're seeing a bit of a change. And that I have to admit, because Ababuna Mwamba, um, who is our minister, minister of culture, actually announced that Leonardo DiCaprio is going to be shooting a movie locally um, very, very soon. So we, we're beginning to, and, and also um, the current governor of Nairobi, the relatively young guy, he's actually a former musician, and he just hosted um, Nairobi Festival, which is a big celebration of Nairobi. So we're seeing a small change, but we're seeing the beginnings of a change, and we're just hoping that um, the new regime will take culture and entertainment more seriously. When, 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 when was the elections? The elections was actually just last year, August. Um, last year, August. So they're about six months now in office. Okay, okay. So they want to make a focus more on um, culture, tourism, but other than other than safaris, other than exactly, exactly. Because even one of the one of the people that I interviewed for, for that article is a DJ called DJ, and he does a lot of shows. You know, even even those. He does a lot of shows in Amboseli and a lot of those tourist attractions. Yeah, so what you're saying Amboseli. is, entertainment can actually be used to increase the value of... Mm -hmm. Can you imagine, um, you do a game drive, and then in the evening, you do a nice intimate concert in Masai yeah. Mara. For those, um, game drives are when, you, when you're in the Jeeps and you search for, for animals. For, for safari. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but, but in the evening, yeah. in the evening you'll be in the lodge. You'll be in the, uh, you know, in the evening. Of course, you sleep within the, the game lodges. So there are definitely there's, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, even in like Fasha, um, there are places which um, a lot of concerts actually happen within the the game reserves. Yeah, Lake Navasha is a um, salt salt lake. Um, very beautiful. Hippos are scary. Um, for those who don't know, hippos are the most feared animals, and in, in, in all of, we we may think it's elephants or lions, but it's actually the hippo. You know, they're built like tanks and they're very aggressive. So, um, in Lake Navisha, we we run from the hippos a lot. And we Kenyans have them outside our tents. <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't believe. I it. No, seriously, we do. Ask yeah. one of us. We're no, they, it's normal for us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you do that, not me. I have Nigerian friends who, who always send me videos of lions like and we're walking like, around the street, <laughs> or lion, a lion getting into your tent, and they're so scared. Us, they're like, oh, we're so lion. used to it. We really are. We really are. But I guess that's one of the beauty, and that's one of the things. Um, hopefully, we're looking forward to in terms of Ghana. Um, you know, look, we're seeing tourism now picking up. I mean, that's been a strength of Kenya. Um, and Boniface will agree with me, and I don't know how many listeners are aware of this, that the hospitality industry in Africa, Kenya leads in hospitality. And hence the reason if you go to places like Dubai, it's all Kenyans that are running, you know, um, hospitality. Um, the same thing's happening to Ghana. If you come to the major hotels in Ghana without having to name them, the management is Kenyan um, as well. So we're seeing that also now slowly Ghana is looking at coming into that area of hospitality as well. Amazing, amazing. And I'm excited for that. Um, personally, when, when we go on game drives, you gain a lot of weight. You wake up in the morning, you eat, then you go on a game drive. You come back for lunch, you eat, then you go on a game drive. We're always eating. You come, back, <laughs> you come back in the evening, you eat, and then you go on a game drive. You stay in Kenya for two day, for 10 days, you might, you might put on some but weight. But it's also because Kenya, in comparison, again, because we're doing a comparison between um, Ghana and Kenya, yeah. Kenya is a lot cheaper when mm -hmm. it comes to food mm -hmm. i mean you're talking about today buying bread in, in i mean milk obviously Ghanaians don't drink milk they yeah. they believe they're you lactose intolerant you know yeah hold hold that though because this is actually bonnie face segment oh it is oh yeah that. sorry sorry bonnie face oh poly 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 <laughs> yeah um or, or, or should we take advantage to have two kenyans no 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 on... let bonnie face do this bonnie face it's your show go on <laughs> yeah that, that's the kenyan way man we, we we just get into conversations and we take over Forgive us, Oh, no, be free, be free. I'm, I'm intruding on you all. Yeah. So, so, so Fatima was talking about Kenyans in Dubai. Guess what? Kenyans in Dubai, hospitality is not the only thing. We also become really good at drama. Yes. And drama brings me to, I'm sure Fatima knows about Samido and Karen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, please explain, explain that for the people who don't know. 
Okay, so backstory. Samido is a big um, Mogidi um, singer. Mogidi is like a folk type of cultural. music. Uh, it's a cultural music, big, really big in one of the biggest tribes, which is um, Ikuyu. So he's like the Michael Jackson of Mogidi. Really big star. Karen Yamu is a politician. So Samido is married, right? But has a kid with Karen. And then at some point, Samido went to 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 US and was having another affair with another lady. So, so so then Karen was on was on Twitter, you know, abusing this other side side chick. <laughs> now the whole <laughs> drama unfolded in Dubai <laughs> during the New Year's because Samido was in a club performing in Dubai with the wife, and then Karen showed up and wanted to sit on Samido, and it was a big okay. big drama. That's, that's pretty bold. That's that's fighting. Yes, but I think this has <laughs> yes. become such a sim- a, a thing for us, Boniface. Don't you think? Not only as Kenyans, as Africans, we've really become, you know, we really carry this thing about uh, one man and a couple of women, <laughs> very seriously. <laughs> I mean, what's wrong with that? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> once, you start, once you start making money, yeah, it comes with the territory. Mm. So it becomes the territory. So the latest twist in the Karen Samido drama is that there's another Mogiri artist that's going to be performing in uh, Dubai. And Karen, after that whole hula balloon, Karen said she's sworn off Samido, she's off Samido. So watch out. By next week, um, Karen will have found his new, her new Mogiri Bay in Dubai. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, um... <laughs> Do you think these just be stunts, or you really think these be love love triangles? I think life is a stunt right now. Everybody is trying to keep up with the Kardashians. Mm. Nothing's real anymore. Everybody's doing stuff for entertainment purposes. Um, what, I, what do you think, Boniface? That, but 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 also, you know, Dubai has become like the playground. No, but it's not a real place, right? Everything is is unreal. Yeah, so. No, that, 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 if you saw the story that we did last week, um, we we're talking about um, you know, mm. and you know, that kind of thing. So, the thing is, um, it's, what was the story that, about that? that? Just, that, just, that, just well, Manipage, just, just, just repeat that story, just you know, real quick, maybe like five seconds. So, so, so basically, Vera Sidika was releasing a song, and so she did this whole fake story about her losing her nash, and it <laughs> came out <laughs> and she had the most her nash. I just love that, but when it comes to but, but this particular thing with Karen and Anthony, I mean, they do have a son together. That, that's fine. You know, it's not uh, any. And what is happening, like, Dubai has become like a playground for the Kenyan. I mean, there's been um, a shopping a shopping mm-hmm. festival since mm-hmm. 15 to 29, 320 concerts, 160 light shows. So, what's happening is Dubai has become that place where the Kenyan rich go to enjoy themselves. And once they are there, they sort of let loose. And, you know, I mean, you're in a whole different country. So, no one. What's happening? So, what happens in Dubai stays in Dubai. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think um, that particular story, I think, was the view. Um, because you could even see, I mean, I mean, if, if you're a side chick, the one thing you don't do is show up in front of the wife, you know, mm-hmm. and do that kind of thing. And she was, honestly, Karen was, she was drunk that day, she had a bit too much to drink. And so, I think that that particular story looks the view. And some people just has a way of attracting drama he just he's, he's a drama magnet so trust me he's like our diamond he's like our kenyan diamond mm. is his ratings going up oh yeah okay but it's good for it so it's good for the brand yeah, so they, 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 but I, I agree with fatima these days it's so hard to know real drama for fake drama you literally mm. need to be like a dci or a fbi as you know agent to investigate to, to see is this real drama or is this uh, we call it kiki this side of, of, of east africa we call that kind of fake uh publicity stand we call it kiki you know maybe since i have you both online you know i do have a kenyan crush maybe y'all can connect me um, <laughs> don't, don't tell nobody <laughs> don't tell nobody in kenya the family okay. michelle the the, the brand mm-hmm. ambassador the entrepreneur no, you. Oh. Who was that? Natalie, Michelle. Oh, Talami. Oh, um, Talami. <laughs> oh my lord, Ooh. you're crucifying me. Oh. You know, Bonnie says I wanted to bring that up last week. 
Yeah. There's a there's an interesting story actually about Shell. Um, one. <laughs> and you're just about to share it live. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble with it for this. Um, she's rumored to play for the other team. Yes. Yeah, no. I wanted to bring that up last week when you were talking about the um, when you were talking about the the the, the, the passion crime. The LGBTQ Ooh. passion crime. Mm-hmm. I wanted to bring her up last week, just and it just slipped my mind. Yeah, it's yeah. true. So, interesting story actually, which came out this week. So, Michelle and Fenagitu were on holiday, and then they took photos together. And the two have been rumored to be lovers for many, for many years. So, when, obviously, when they're featured together, everyone is like, hey, these guys are now back together because Michelle was dating another lady before. Um, when they broke up, so now when that photo was taken, everyone was like, Hey, Fena and Michelle are together. But well, you know, Fena maybe, maybe I can change that. After, you know, you know. Huh? I said, Maybe I can change that. Who knows? <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> like I say, we don't know what's true, what's not anymore. <laughs> F- Fatima, um, you know, we t- talked about it last week, but um, LGBTQ is, is illegal and even it's LGBTQIA. Plus. Wow. <laughs> um, I it, missed it, that part. Yeah, I missed that part. Oh, oh yeah, now it's uh, yeah. It's plus. They you... just said they just gave up. Yeah, you know, respectfully. Um, h- how do you how do you feel about you know, it's punishable by death, and like, how do you feel about it still? You know, by everything being so public. See, look, everyone. You know, what did they say? Different different strokes for different folks. Um, you know, you, you've got to understand that we're, we're still, as a continent, and it's not only about Kenya or Ghana, um, as a continent, we're still not ready to understand the changes that are happening around. And we're also not at that level of understanding that a lot of things that get done or that are getting pushed on, whether it's tran- trends or whatever else, are accepted very differently in different countries. So our challenges is more cultural. There's also the religious aspects of things, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. So how do you do that from, from, a, from a brand perspective? Look, your branding at the end of the day, like I said, is different, um, different levels. There's what you have on the national level. On the le- national level, you have restrictions, whether it's Ghana, it's Kenya, they both say they're not going to accept the LGBTQIA um, because they believe that it's the people that are speaking um, on behalf of the Constitution to say that they cannot accept it. But when you go down to the ground, it's different. Um, there are communities of it. They, they do exist. They are amongst us. So we could be saying that we're more ostrich putting our heads you know, in the sand and trying to pretend that this doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Um, with what happened in Kenya, very sadly, um, last couple of days with the murder of the fashion designer, um, as much as it's being seen as passionate, and it's one of the words that you use, that it was passion killing, mm-hmm. maybe we need to dig de- deeper and question, was it passion killing or was it there was some homophobic issues and fears well, that may have triggered it? Well, you know, we talked about in de- that in detail last week, so I don't want to, you know, repeat yeah. it too much. Um, and, and me personally, I stay out of politics. You oh, know, I stay out of politics, really, religion. Really Those are two things I stay out of as well. Yeah. Um, Bunny, Bunny Face, you, you still have some more time with us, correct? Well, Fatima has stolen my time, so I also still have time. Oh, please okay. go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great, great answer. Great share answer. and share alike. <laughs> please, let's move. Any, any more stories? So, because I want to ask for T. Yes, real quick, so, real, real quick. I want to ask for mm-hmm. Tima more questions, but I want you here when I when, when we talk about some of these other things. So as long as we can keep well, you, I really want you around. No problem, no problem. I'm around for you, Rashad. Asante. And for all our listeners in Accra and also right here in Nairobi. So, um, this week also another interesting story is Karim Madonga. Karim, Karim Madonga is a boxer. He's a really, best way to describe him, I guess, he's like the Floyd Mayweather. Floyd uh, Mayweather. Mayweather. Oh, you can't mess with Tanzania, you know, He's a loud mouth, you know. Um, but also Muhammad Ali had that thing of him staying like a bee flyer. Eh? Was it uh, fly like a butterfly, staying mm-hmm. like a bee, you know, mm-hmm. talking trash? Muhammad Ali. So, Madonna comes in, talks trash, and I think that was new to Kenyan sports, and especially Kenyan boxing, because we don't have a loudmouth boxer. Um, so it really, really captured the attention and the imagination of of the public. So everybody wanted to watch um, the fights. I mean, people like um, our MV, 
and also radio presenter Chala Mo was, was seen um, out like outright supporting the Tanzania. So big, uh, it was a big, big match that happened yesterday. Um, luckily, Madonga won. But otherwise, if he hadn't won, <laughs> Kenya mm-hmm. team would have won. <laughs> Crucify him. Now, let me tell you one thing, Rashad, yeah. and Fatima will tell you, never, ever, 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 ever get on the wrong side of Kenya. Kenyans on Twitter? Oh, yeah. oh my <laughs> God. Oh, my days. <laughs> You made fingers. CNN apologize. Like yes. CNN had to send a representative. When they called us the hotbed of what? Of terrorism. Of terrorism. Obama <laughs> was oh, wow. You know? So, Kenyans on Twitter. So, yeah. So, but at least he was on the right side of, of he was respectful. He was boastful, but in a respectful way. And he won. So, he, 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 he was saved with the wrath of, of Kenyans on Twitter. Wow. So, um, are there any more stories you want to share with us? One more thing. So, Afrima is actually going on right now to speak. Um, Afrima is is, is kind of considered the the Grammys of Kenya, of, of Africa, sorry. So, all of Africa right now is in Dakar, Senegal. And uh, we are really waiting to see who's going who, to, you know, bring home some medals. Some of the Kenyans that are down there, Wanabokadi are down there, um, Kita Kering is down there. Budaka is down there, and a whole bunch of other amazing, amazing Kenyan singers and Kenyan, um, you know, play, music, DJs and, and artists who are down there representing our country, and of course all, all artists and DJs all across yeah. um, Africa right now are in Dakar, Senegal, and so we're just waiting to see who's gonna clinch more more Afrima, you know, um, awards. But what's been happening? Um, so Afrima is a meeting program in the sense that it's not just a board show. On the 13th, which is Friday, they had the African That's Music Business, happening. which is like a networking. A networking for all the, the entire music, uh, African um, you know, entertainment industry. Then they also had the African Music Village, which happened yesterday. And a lot of amazing performances by Big Square, Chigo Savage, Sake, Baba Mal, you know, Muzaka. So many amazing performances that went down yesterday. So today we're just waiting to hear who's going to bring home the Afrima. And um, yes, not to boast, but I'm waiting for Kenyans to bring more Afrimas than than Kenyans. Great, Bunny Face, thank you. Stick stick around for a while. Um, I want to ask welcome. Fatima about her lineage and um, some of her background information. But while I have you, um, we spoke early in the week. You were sharing some of the Kenyan foods that are found yeah. here in Ghana. And one of the ones that you mentioned that struck me the most was samosa. Oh yeah. That that's here because I like spring rolls, and whenever they don't have spring rolls, I always say, okay, I take samosa. But samosa is 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 a Indian, Indian yeah. dish that's prominent. Yeah. Well, the foods. So one thing that uh, I think we spoke about um, the other day, we have a lot of similarities in Kenya with um, Arabic and Indian foods and languages even the Swahili language is a blend of Arabic Persian and Indian so even our language in terms of how we count in Swahili is it's a literal replica of the Arabic word mm-hmm. samosa chapati which are our Swahili words for our foods are actually Indian words as well so there's a lot of similarities and the beauty about Kenya is we're so cosmopolitan that it's in bed you talk about a car it's called gari where it's the same thing in hindi as well so there's just a lot of similarities so we tend to be able to um it's a melting pot of a place a place and i think that's where the beauty of it is but when you were talking about the similarities i think one of the, the key similarities is also in just our our main food which is ugali and you come into Ghana and you have, you know, Kenke and you have Fufu and you have Gari. The only difference is the ingredient that goes in and some it's cassava and the other is maize. But there's a thing about Kenyans and Ugali. And this is something that people, I mean, if you talk to Kenyans living in Ghana, they will tell you whenever we travel, everyone's asking who's coming back from Kenya, please bring me Ugali. I mean, we carry it. What exactly is Ugali? It's just maize flour. Just maize flour. Yeah, but there's a difference in terms of how we mill our maize flour, and then we want it in a certain way. It's not supposed to be coarse. It's not supposed to be too fine. Mm -hmm. The color is uh, crucial. So I know whenever I used to have have to come in, I've got to bring it, because you can't eat anything else. Once you're an Ugali person, that's it. 
Bunny face, I want to ask you, and then I want I want Fatima to ask you the same question. If you went to three different restaurants in three different days for dinner, what would you order? Kenyan food? Yes, Kenyan food. Okay. So <laughs> I'm coming to Nairobi. Okay. I'm so if, you, if one, you must have, um, like Fatima said, ugali with nyamachoma. Oh, nyamachoma you. is like roast. Say the name again. Ugali and nyamachoma. Nyamachoma. Nyama means meat and choma is roast. So roast okay, meat. Roast beef. Okay, okay. Mm. 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 Bring it down with some nice kachumbari. Kachumbari. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a relish of onions and tomato, you know, okay. with a bit of onion oh. salt. Okay, okay. That's definitely it. Um... The next thing I would have either pilau or biryani, mm -hmm. and especially if you get like the original, that, that's a coastal dish. Um, so ugali is more popular in the west side, Kansas side, Buyas, especially Buyas. Buyas are mm -hmm. oh, oh. And, and you have to eat ugali and you have to press it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and what is that made of? Maize. It's oh. basically like oh, so talking about he's talking about ugali okay, like okay. fufu, yeah. Oh wow! So, so we eat it the we eat it the same harder. way as fufu, but harder, yeah. Okay, I understand. Harder, yeah. Then the other thing is now pilau is like the jollof, correct? I think. Right? Yeah. Fatima? Yes, correct jollof. Like jollof. So, but I think it's better. I biryani Fatima can be the jollof. I've never tasted jollof, but I'm being patriotic here. I think I'm, I'm still a pilau like fan pilau. over jollof. Let yeah, me, there you go. Let me let me ask a question from the Facebook chat. Remember, 3FM 92.7 FM. Shout us out on our Facebook page at 3FM 92.7. If you send us some questions, we'll make sure to ask some of them. We'll do the best we can. We have a question about music. Someone wants to know, how is the music industry in Kenya? Like, do they add the culture to the sound? And what is the vibe in terms of vibing to the music? Is it a lot of cultural mix? Is it originality? In modern times, please describe some of that. Bodyface, wow. you want to start? So, yeah, sure thing. Um, just like Fatima said, Kenya is an extremely cosmopolitan place. So you find even musically, um, there are sort of bubbles and clusters that happen. And I don't know if I'll even touch all the different clusters. Um, one cluster, like I said, is the cultural uh, music. So you have the Ohangla, which is for the duos. You have the Kiri, that's for the Kikuyu. You have Tarab, that's for the guys at the coast. So you have those cultural and tribal sort of um, groupings of music, and they're really big and famous. Um, your, your DJ asked me for you know, what are the top trending, uh, the 10 top trending uh, songs, and they really presented that. Because you'll find there's a Kamba song in there that is really big in Kamba side. Um, so you have that. Then you have the urban music. And it comes to urban music again, highly segmented. You have like the hip hop, the youth youth culture. So you have the genge tones. Um, you have also that's like on the downtown, uptown. You have ama piano, which is the mm -hmm. South African ama piano. Um, a lot of Afro beat is also there a lot in uptown. Um, the urban uptown. Then you have lingala. You call it, hmm? We have a lot of lingala tarab. Yes. Now and then you have also rumba. Rumba is what's, what's lingala param. So Lingala, so Lingala is more is, from, uh, go on, go on, Boniface. From Congolese. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the technical time for it is Sukus and Seven, but Lingala, te technically Lingala is actually a, a language in Congo. So Lingala is the, what we call, our uh, Congolese music, we typically call it Lingala. So because of the influence of Congolese musicians for, for so many years, um, there's been that, and also there was Kenyan rumba, Congolese rumba. So there's a whole like segment about Lingala, Afghanini, um, Sukus, Seben, and Rumba that is really, really big. You know, Fali, Fali Pupa has a big following. The kings of Rumba in, in Kenya, the likes of Eswanika, Commandos, you know, those are the, like, the legends. Okay. Um, so, yes, it's a very eclectic mix. And depending on which side of town you attend a party, most likely you'll hear a different type of music. If is, you is there an club, artist that maybe a, we might we may have heard here? Yeah, definitely. People like Saudi Soul, you've definitely heard of them. Okay. I mean, they're they're known. But that being said, I think what is really interesting is that 
West African music has really started picking up a lot back home. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I know when I get into Kenya and all of a sudden I can hear, I can straight away tell, eh, that's Burner Boy and oh my God, that is Shatawale. So we're able to tell the thing. But again, the West African uh, beats are so consistent, you can straight away tell this is West African. Mm-hmm. When you come to Kenya, it's a little different. It's not easy to straight away tell that this could be Kenyan. Um, because like Boniface says, you, you you get a Congolese aspect in one part, because when we say East Africa, we're taking into account Congo, we're taking into account Tanzania, we're taking into account a lot of um, other Congo countries. Congo is considered East Africa. Uh, no, Congo is part of, uh, is, is considered East Africa, yes, now. Um, and they also speak Swahili, Tanzania speaks Swahili, Uganda speaks Swahili. So there's a lot of um, similarities, but because their kind of beats, their kind of original, their kind of drums are very different, um, you still have uh, some some bits, you're not never too sure whether it's Kenyan or not. And that's why it becomes a lot more different. But this is the beauty about Africa today. And that's why I was talking about this aspect of the African branding. We've just become so flawless right now. I'm a piano, which is South African. I mean, go into any club in Ghana or go to a club in Kenya and people are dancing to it. You know, I was just telling the DJ, you want to play Malaika and everyone will know Malaika. The room where they come in and you know check the girls out and they're covered and you have to find out which one is your wife. So each um, community, each tribe has its own um, so, rituals. So the faces are covered, and you have you have to already know which one is your. You have, you, to, you have to figure it out because you're probably picking the wrong woman, um, right? What is it called? Bony face, the ingarario. Yeah. So yeah. So explain the dowry, that dowry the dowry time. And you've got to come and pick your your and they'll all be dressed the same and they'll be covered and then you've got to figure out so unless what if you pick the wrong one well she probably will give you a hint beforehand that look for my tool or you know <laughs> or, or or something um but it's a it's it's very um exciting but when you come to um culture the one thing that i have to salute um ghana for is its cultural um aspects which is one of the things that i feel if ghana was ever to do brand Ghana, um, mm-hmm. that is one of the things that they need to take and write. Um, so for example, Boniface, I don't know if you know this, but in Ghana, funerals are only held on the weekends. Okay, they only have them on Saturday, Sunday. And um, the reason is also one for people not to miss work and then do whatever they need to do. And then funerals in Ghana is a party. It's mm-hmm. a party. They put billboards up, they put posters up mm-hmm. and anybody can come and attend and they'll come in and they'll close a the street and put a tent you know, and there's a party going on. People are boozing and drinking because in Ghana, it's about a celebration of life. In Kenya, we're crying and mourning, you know, um, and, and, and and trying to find how we can fundraise for funerals. And that's not the way it is here. And then the other interesting thing in Ghana, which I was like totally floored as well, was um, how you create coffins based on the, um, the job of the person. So if a person's a teacher, you have a coffin in a pencil. If a person was a photographer, their coffin's a camera. It's like, wow, you know, it's such a big deal. You don't have those kind of stuff happening, you know, in in, in Kenya. So when I look at the two, I'm like, there's just, this is the beauty about this continent. You know, everyone has something unique and different. Now, when I came and moved here to Ghana, uh, Kenya is known for creating masks, you know, like the Mukamba community have different types of masks, a different community has different types of masks. We don't see any rituals behind it. But coming to buy a mask in Ghana, the first thing was like, Fatima, please don't pick that mask because the probability is it has sp- spiritual connections or it's going to be linked to somebody in the ancestors. So the belief in that kind of stuff is a lot more prevalent in Ghana than it is in Kenya. And then obviously the religious aspects, you come into Ghana and everyone is either divine or peace or, uh, you know, every little store is named against a biblical name, which is something we don't get in Kenya. What, what is the budget for a funeral in Kenya? Jesus, it's <laughs> it's astronomical. Boniface, correct me. You could be, see, here you keep, you, you, you would quickly do things unless somebody is coming from, you know, the a palace or the, a kingdom where we take time. But you, in Kenya, you're fundraising for everything from the coffin to um, the funeral event itself, to the food, to everything. There's a mchango, that's what Harambe 
is all about. You must have heard of that word. It's all coming together. It's like Ubuntu. Ubuntuism and Harambe is in the days of uh, the President Moy, there used to be this thing where you come out of the basket and you say Harambe. It's like to collect funds and get people. It's like a tithe that you do in church, but the difference is is you're doing it from the community Mm -hmm. and people come together to pay hospital bills and stuff like that. But now it's reached a point where it's tight for everyone. Everyone's having a problem, you know. So what is the fastest way? How can we do it without having to really spend a lot on it? But you come to Ghana and you realize it's a party. It's a party here. A celebration of life. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Clothing. Um, I think when people think of clothing in Kenya, they think of a Maasai tribe. <laughs> it seems like um, Maasai blanket. Yeah, Maasai blanket. That's it. Yeah. Um, is there anything similar to Kente um, traditional Ghanaian no. fabric? It's just more. No, we have the Kitenge, um, and which Kitenge. is the, the Kitenge or the Leso, and then obviously the Maasai blankets. Which um, I think one of the things that we failed as as Kenya, but I guess it's not only a Kenya thing; it's Africa. But Ghana's done pretty well in that in terms of trademarking its um, items. I know the Chiondo or what we call the Kiondo is no longer a Kenyan registered um, word because people are using it and somebody else has registered it even to the design mm. when ideally it is Kenyan. But if you walk into the streets of, Ke- in, of Osu, for example, here, you see the slippers with beads and all that. They're all being brought in from Kenya. Mm-hmm. So we are already in some ways because of this whole thing of trade and people moving and little people coming with one suitcase of slippers, you know, bring it to Osu, so we're getting exposed to it. So now, let me let me interject real quick, because that, that's actually what I wanted to get into. Um, please, tell us about the ACFTA. The Continental the Act- Free Trade. Yes, yes. Okay. So, I am not sure how many of... I, I know that a lot of people don't know much about it, not only the, here, the but African everywhere. It's after the Inter- African Continental Free Trade mm-hmm. Agreement. Yeah. Um, and this was done where... Um, The idea was to do something very similar to what Europe has done with Brexit and bring the countries together. So just in layman terms, each country um, has its own uh, national tariffs and then they have regional blocks. So for example, the East African community is the EAC for East Africa, the SADC is for the Southern Africa, Uh, West Africa we have the ECOWAS and then you have also COMESA and stuff like that. So that is now regional bodies. And what we have done now is taken it to the um, continental level where the regional bodies come together. And what we're saying is that Africans can now trade amongst one another. So this was started in, um, uh, the, the conversation has been going on for a while. And in 2021, in 2018 is when um, the African Union came together and said, hey, listen, as Africans, we really need to do this. Come on, we're a population of 1.3 billion. You know, if we can sell to ourselves, we really don't have to worry about selling to anyone else. Yeah. So uh, in 2021, January, it came live. The Secretariat st- uh, sits here in Ghana. Mm-hmm. And uh, 44 countries um, came on board and said, okay, we're ready to start. And as of two months ago, eight countries have signed up, of which Kenya and Ghana is among those eight to start trading within one another. Um, Kenya and Ghana have bilateral trade agreements. Now, what the idea of the continental free trade means Mm -hmm. is that we're going to start with a five-year, eight-year, and then a 10-year. Within 10 years, the continent is going to trade free, meaning you can send anything from here to the other country at zero duty. But Mm -hmm. obviously, there's a defined list because each country is going to protect what it's good at. So if Ghana is good at cocoa, it's going to ensure nobody else brings cocoa into Ghana. So Mm -hmm. each country has created a list of um, products that they would like to protect and then the idea is to see how we can synergize between um, Kenya and Ghana for example if Kenya right now is leading manufacturing can we sell cocoa powder from here to Kenya or to Ethiopia for them to produce um, chocolates you know for us instead of us sending it um, you know to Belgium or wherever else so that also then leads into now free movement of people so people within the continent are going to move My only concern, and it's one of the discussions we really need to have as Africans, Mm -hmm. is that I keep reminding people that what happened in South Africa Mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, and twice in a row, the xenophobia that took place was Africans against Africans, right? Mm -hmm. So are we ready as a continent to say that if we're going to have Nigerians coming into Kenya, or if we have, uh, you know, Tanzanians uh, moving into Uganda, um, is is it saying that we're going to be okay with that? Are we saying that we do 
have the liberty to have those kind of jobs where it's okay for anyone to cross the border now and work. So there are going to be some tough conversations we need to have, but the beauty about the continental free trade is that we can now trade amongst ourselves and really okay. make it a reality. I want to ask you some more questions about how Ghanaians and Kenyans can take advantage of you know this free trade. But first, let's take a break. 3FM, 92.7, we'll be back. Let's get your final words. Um, first, I want to ask you, how can Ghanians take advantage of the free trade, especially during this open season? Um, the beauty of the continental free trade is that um, as much as it is for larger corporates and companies, because you have to have an export license, you have to be able to um, um, have the requirements and the funding to be able to trade across, it's the most crucial and beautiful opportunity for the small medium enterprises, the SMEs. And why do I say that? So, for example, if Ethiopia says that it wants a thousand, uh, like 10,000 pairs of shoes from Ghana, for example, mm -hmm. um, and Ethiopia is able to provide the leather to Ghana, it wants Ghanaians to make slippers, um, you know, to send. And you have a factory that's only able to produce, let's say, 500 pairs. What it means is that we have so many small artisans who are producing slippers every day. Is there a way they can collaborate and come together and be suppliers to this bigger factory to meet the 10,000 demand, right? So they don't have to go all looking for how to chase for licenses and export documents. That So it's a good opportunity for collaboration, um, collaboration within the country where Ghanaians can come together and be able to become part of the bigger supply chain. And at the same time, it's also an opportunity for Ghanaians to cross the borders and be able to do things within the continent. Any last, we have three minutes, any, any, any last, any last words, um, any way to reach out to you, any last words, anything that's on your mind? Um, look, everyone, uh, if anyone wants to reach me, I'm Fatima Ali Mohammed on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, I share a lot of stuff on there, but more than that, I think it's time that we stop, um, we stop as Africans wanting to depend on leaders, wanting governments to do things for us. We've got to start doing things for ourselves. Um, because government is only supposed to be there to be enablers and managers. Mm -hmm. We need to start doing things um, on individual levels as groups, you know, as um, collaborators. As much as we have differences, we have a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. And we need to stop crying foul because we seem to be sitting and waiting. Thank God we've moved away from that image that people had of Africa where we were carrying a ball and there was a child with flies running around its head. We've moved away from that. But that is, we moved away from it still as a visual, but we still continue to be seen as a continent that is begging and does not know how to do its things. We have so much going for ourselves. We really need to come together. We, I mean, I keep saying, if you want to create a powerful punch, you need all five fingers. You can't do it with just one. So we need to come together. We need to work together and, and make Africa a reality. Next week, we will be in the Af West African country of Liberia. We will be in the West African country of Liberia.